haqiqat, then reach to haqiqat. And once you reach to haqiqat, shariat doesn't really meaning mean anything, you are really above that. So they have reached to that level of graduation, we are still down there. But remember, we are not alone, even Rasulullah is with us on the level of shariat. You know, so uh, that's where we have the problem with that. Then we have number four, which of the following statement is valid or correct? And I wanted to make sure you got the concept and what we have been talking about. Um, There are four statements here. One is that Ali is the Raziq, since God has absolutely delegated his powers to Ali, and God has retired. Number two, Ali is the Raziq, independent of God. Number three, Ali is the Raziq, as the wasila or wasita of Allah's grace. And number four, none of above. It is only C. You know, A, B are not acceptable and correct. And then number five, which of the following statement is valid and correct? The past prophets sought help of Ali physically. B, Ali is the one who made the fire cool for Prophet Ibrahim. Or C, Ali delivered Prophet Musa from Fir'aun. Or D, the prophets before Rasulullah sought help of God through the Nur, to the Anwar, or the name of Ahlul Bayt. The only valid answer would be D. Then we come to the last one, which is really not a theological issue, but it is important to understand this concept also. That according to the statement of Ayatollah Khoi, I have given the exact wordings of him in the handout. Um, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt considered the Zabiha of Sunnis who deny the Vilayat the way we know it. What would be the answer there? It's not haram or majus or dirty, it is A. Because remember, the issue of Taharat and Najasat is a dunyavi issue, it's nothing to do with the Ukhrawi issue. It's nothing to do with the Najat and the Akhirah. It is the rules which govern our life in this dunya. Before we, want, we move on to the Imam of Imam Ali ibn Musa Raza alayhi salatu wasalam, <clears throat> just one more point about a question which was raised last week, and this is a relevant question about how the Ismailis, you know, consider Ali. I actually have a book, I bought this in Vancouver, published by uh, Ismailis. By one of the scholars by the name of Abu Ali, and they say, and they the holy kalim of Ismailis is La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah, Aliyun Amirul Mu'minin, Aliyullah. Now, if we were left with those Arabic wordings, we would have serious problems. But this is what I'm saying, that just as we don't want the Wahhabis, you know, to label us as kafir because we say, Ya Ali, we have to be careful, we have to ask them, what do they mean? Now, this is their own book, written for their own people, and say, the translation is very interesting. Now, in Arabic it says, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah Aliyun Amirul Mu'minin Aliyullah. Now, those last two words are problematic. The translation is very interesting. It says, meaning, there is no God but Allah, 
محمد از اللہ میسنجر اللہ علی از ویری انٹرسٹنگ ٹرانسلیشن اللہ علی از دی کمانڈر آف دی ٹرو بلیور دی ورڈ علی 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 اللہ ہیز بین ٹرانسلیٹڈ از علی ہو بلونگس ٹو اللہ از امیر المنین If that is the meaning that they have, well, we still have a problem that maybe their Arabic is not that good. You know, instead of saying Aliullah, they should have said Aliyun Waliullah. That would have been much, you know, or for example, Aliyun Amirul Mu'minin, Waliullah. If you look at the Arabic writings, Waliullah and Aliullah, the only difference is in one letter. Waliullah has Waam in the beginning and Aliullah has I, I really suspect that there was a problem with whoever was writing it, you know, and instead of saying Aliyun Amirul Mu'minin Waliyullah, it ended up in the form of Aliyun Amirul Mu'minin Aliyullah. With the translation then, you know, it really ties our hands to give that kind of a fatwa against them on this issue. So this is just one example of, you know, We have to be sometimes, you know, careful before we uh, make that statement about them. Salawat. <coughs> as far as uh, the, okay, just for, for barakat, you know, we'll start with this ayat from Surah An-Nisa, ayat number 59. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering all the believers, Ya ayu al-lazeen amanu ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasoolah ulil amri minkum. Obey Allah, and then obey the messenger and those who are in authority from among you. The command of ati'u, ati'u, in the second phase is uh, exactly the same regarding the prophet and regarding the ulil amr. And based on that, Imam Fakhruddin Razi, a very famous Sunni Mufassir of Qur'an, says that just as Rasul is ma'asum and infallible, Ulul Amr also must be uh, ma'asum and infallible. And so after coming to that conclusion of, this, of his tafsir, now he gets stuck. They don't believe that the Khulafa are ma'asum. So what he then he finds an ingenious way of solving his own puzzle here. And he says, well, what it means is that the Ummah collectively is ma'asum. But the problem is, Allah is saying to the Ummah, all the members of the Ummah, obey Allah and obey the Messenger, and obey Ulul Amr minkum, from among you. So he's, Allah is not talking about the Ummah collectively. And it doesn't make sense that you, you, you put one billion Ummah there, Individually they are very ma'asum, you put them together they become ma'asum, this doesn't make sense at all. You know, so it's, minkum is very important there, that it, it doesn't refer to uh, the ummah collectively, it refers to only some individuals, and according to ayat al-Hir, that applies to the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salatu wa salam. Moving on to the situation of the imamate of uh, Imam Raza alayhi salam, we have to again go back and very briefly look at the situation of the days of Imam Musa al-Kazim alayhi salam. We looked at the last days of Imam al-Sadiq and how it was difficult for him uh, to basically declare who is his successor. Um, the same situation continued with the imams all the way till the 11th imam. In the case of Imam Musa al-Kazim era, this is a very dangerous time for the Shias. Uh, just to summarize the situation, Imam basically uh, lived for about 55 years, and 35 years of his life uh, was his imamate. And um, during his time, there were four Khulafa who ruled. One was Mansur, and Mansur was a very brutal Khalifa, especially when it came to the Ahlul Bayt. At the end, if we have a time, I'll, you know, mention a narration about the hatred that he had towards uh, Ali and Ali Ali. The second uh, ruler of uh, that time was Mahdi, uh, who he was considered to be a lenient person. 
but i have there the remarks lenient plus question mark because even though they were lenient with the public when it came to the imam zahir al bayt the attitude was very different an imam during those uh, almost 10 years of mahdi's time this is the only time he really uh, got the opportunity to publicly sit down and talk and teach his own followers and but because of that imam's fame spread in the muslim world and with the fame of imam it became a question a problem for mahdi so even this lenient khalifa eventually because of the fear he, he had about the a popularity of the of the seventh imam he asked him by force to come to baghdad although imam was not put in prison for a long time during the mahdi's time he was released um but that's just one example of the situation that imam faced then we have hadi who just lived for one year a very careless person uh, you know busy with his own luxury life uh then we come to the time of harun uh he ruled from 170 to 193 of the uh hijra calendar and imam was poisoned and killed in the year 183 um and so this is during, during the time of uh, harun again he was very brutal towards the imam and the last 5 years of the imam's life is in prison under harun in basra and then in baghdad And so remember this situation and also remember that all the imams uh from Imam Jafar Sadiq onwards uh you know they lived in a situation where they did not really have uh freedom as such. And so let us look at the uh nafs that we have the declaration of imamat of the eighth imam um mentioned by the seventh imam we have four examples of the time before he went into prison. and then we have four examples of the nas uh during the time of the uh prison and, and the, the reason why i'm bringing this that when he was free still there was so much you know pressure even among uh the the shias when they would go there they were informers and spies uh you know seeing who who is going to the imam whom he is meeting and so many times this kinds of wasiyat were very uh, private there were a couple of incidents where the imam more publicly in a bigger gathering of banu hashim only uh, declared imam raza al islam as his wasi uh, the first example we have is of daud uh, bin kathir al rihqi um, he says he says when i became very old i went to imam musa al kazim and he said i'm advanced in years and my bones are weak and you know i don't have the ability to see you all the time and there was a time that during your your father i asked i met him and i asked him who is his wasi and successor he pointed me to you to you now today after 30 years i'm asking the same question to you now who is your successor and at that time imam you know uh, told him it is abul hasan ar rida Abu Hassan was one of the uh, kunniya of uh, Imam Raza alayhi salam. You see Abu Hassan is the famous kunniya of Amir al-Mu'minin and then we have three more imams who had the same kunniya and the difference in history is if you say Abu Hassan it refers to Ali bin Abi Talib. If you say Abu Hassan al-Awwal refers to Imam Musa al-Kazim. If you say Abu Hassan al-Thani refers to Imam Raza alayhi salam. If you say Abu Hassan al-Salif that refers to the 10th imam and so uh this is where imam says that you know my wasi is uh, abul hasan ar rida then we see another one uh, daud az zirbi he says that i had certain properties you know money and items which had been given by the people to me uh because imam had many wakala and the wakala of two are of two kinds there is a wakil of uh, mal and then there is a, a wakil sharhi wakil mal is the one who is authorized you know to gather the huquq whether it's homes or zakat or whatever and wakil sharhi is somebody uh, who is actually uh, there as a source of knowledge 
teaching people on behalf of the Imam. Sometimes the positions were all combined. There were many, many wakala of the Imam who were wakil of the Maal. And Dawood al-Zurbi says, once I went to Imam Musa al-Kazim and brought all the amanat that I had from the people. Imam took only half of it and half he left it with me. He said, you keep this. And so he said, what will I do with it? And he said, don't worry. The one who is the owner of this, he will ask for it himself. So this was in a way of showing him that who will be the next Imam. And see, it seems this happened towards the uh, later days of the uh, life of Imam uh, Musa Kazim al -Islam. So Dawood al-Zurbi says that a time came when seventh Imam passed away. And then Imam Riza called me. He called me and he said, you, you have some amanat which belong to me. And that is how I came to know that he is the next Imam. So even indirect methods were used by the seventh Imam to let people know. Even a wakil was not told directly who is the name, the name of the next Imam, rather different methods were used. Then we have a third example of Ali bin Abdullah al-Hashimi. Uh, he's from Banu Hashim. And uh, from his mother's side, he's from the children of Jafar al-Tayyar. He says once about 50 to 60 of our family members and some of the Shias had gathered, whether it was an occasion or it was just an accident, that they happened to be inside Masjid al-Nabi by the grave of the Prophet at that time. And uh, the seventh Imam came in, and with him was a boy who was, who was holding his hand. And as, as soon as he entered in the gathering, he said, Do you people know who, whom I, who, who am I? And they said, yes, you are our master, you are our uh, Sayyid, our elder. And then he said, can you describe my lineage? And so they described that you are Musa bin Ja'far bin Muhammad. And then he said, who is this with me? And they said, this is Ali bin Musa bin Ja'far. And after they were identified the father and the son, then the Imam says, فَاشْحَدُوا أَنَّهُ وَكِيلِ فِي حَيَاتِ وَوَصِيِّ بَعْدَ مَمَاتِ that be with witness that he is my wakil in my life and he is my wasi after my death. And probably this is happening at the time before Imam is arrested and being taken to uh, Iraq. <coughs> One more example of the same time where the narrator actually mentions that this happened, this conversation took place a year before the Imam was taken by force to Basra. And this is by Muhammad bin Sanam. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting narration where he says that one day I was with the seventh Imam while his son was with him, Imam Raza. And he said, Imam, turn to me. And then, you know, Imam said that it, a time will come within a year which will put you in distress. And so Imam was referring to his own situation where he will be uh, arrested, and if an imam is arrested, even the Shias would be in distress. And then, uh, so Muhammad bin Sanan then asked him that, uh, may my life be a ransom for you? You know, uh, what, what is going to happen? And at that time he says, whoever usurps the rights of this son of mine, and denies his imamat after me, he is same as the person who took over the right of Ali bin Abi Talib and denied the imamat of Ali after Rasulullah. And so, uh, you know, Muhammad bin Sanan, when he heard this, he says to Imam Musa al-Kazim that, O oh, Imam, I swear by Allah, in the name of Allah, that if Allah prolongs my life, I will submit to your son and I will accept his imamat. And Imam Musa al-Kazim informed him. This is again the element of ilm ghayb Imam Musa al-Kazim is saying that yes, Allah will prolong your life and you will accept my son as the imam and you will come, you will call people towards his imamat and also the imam who will come after him. So Imam foretold Muhammad bin Salam that you will live during the time of Imamat of Musa al-Kazim, uh, Ali al-Rawa, 
as well as you will see the Imam who will be after him. And so he asked him, what will be his name? I know your son, but what is the name of your grandson? And Imam Musa al-Qazim says his, his, his son, his name would be Muhammad. And Muhammad bin Sanan says, I accept and I submit. When I see both of them, I'll accept and submit to them. At that time, Imam mentioned something which really is a matter of envy for us regarding Muhammad bin Sanan. And this should be our dua. When Muhammad bin Sanan declared his loyalty to Imam Musa al-Qazim about the Imam of Imam uh, Ali Raza and Imam Muhammad Taqi, Imam Musa al-Qazim says that yes, you are true. I have found your name mentioned in the book of my grandfather Ali bin Abi Talib alayhi salatu salam. You have been mentioned among the Shias of Ali. And so, you know, our dua should be that our name should be there in that book of Ali, which is with Imam Zaman Ajalallahu Ta'ala Farajah Sharif. Let us go to some other narration, again four of them. Incidentally, it brings us to number eight, and this is the eighth Imam we are talking about. Uh, and these are the narrations where Imam is already in prison. Now, the concept of prison in modern times and old times are different. There were no prisons by themselves. Prison those days meant that, you know, uh, the senior officials of the Khalifa or the government were made responsible that, okay, this person is in your charge. You have to make sure he doesn't run away. Or whatever, whatever conditions were there, that even if, you know, he has been given relative freedom, you know, he's allowed to do this, but not that. And so basically prison means Imam was given in charge of someone or the other and lived in their house and he was not allowed to come out. Or even if the meetings were there, it was very restricted with the presence of the informers and the spies. So when they use this term in prison, it's not like the jail we think of uh, during our time. Now from the year 178, 283. This is the last five years of Imam's life. Imam is now not free. He was first taken to Basra, and then from there, when the person in charge said, I don't want to, when he told Harun, that, you know, you put a wrong person in my charge. You know, he is a good person. He just, you know, I haven't, I haven't seen anything bad from him. That's where he was moved from one jailer to another. Eventually, he ended up in Baghdad. Now we have first narration from Hussein bin al-Mukhtar, and this is why Imam was in Basra. Hussein bin Mukhtar says that I was sitting with my group of Shias when we received a letter, written document from the prison, from Basra, from the Imam, and when we opened it, we saw it was a message for us from the Imam where he says, Ahdi ila akbaru will be. That my position will go to my eldest of my sons. And so we have this, you know, quite a few examples of this that, that Imam is, is able to somehow, you know, because there were even people inside Harun's administration who were Shias. One of the senior ministers was by the name of Ali bin Yaqteen, who was a minister but a Shia. A Shia in Taqiyya in disguise. So Imam was able somehow to, you know, uh, communicate with his followers uh, sometimes. We have another narration from uh, Al Hussein bin Nu'man al Sahaf, who narrates that he and Hisham bin Hakam and Ali bin Yaqeen, the minister, he said, We were in Baghdad and we were sitting in one place together. When Ali bin Yaqteen, who had access to the Imam, where he had been, uh, you know, put in prison, uh, he says, once I went to him, and he told me that, oh, Ali bin Yaqteen. Uh, and this also shows that when Imam was in prison in Iraq for the five, five years, Imam Raza salam was somehow able to visit sometimes. Not all the time, but he was there. And at that incident, in that meeting in the jail between Imam Raza and Imam Musa al-Kazim Ali bin Yaqteen was present. 
In that meeting, Ali bin Yaqteen says to Hisham bin Hakam and his colleagues, he says, the Imam told me that, O oh, Ali bin Yaqteen, this Ali is the chief of my sons and I have given my kunniyat of Abu Hassan to him. When Hisham bin Hakam, a very prominent Sahabi of the sixth Imam, he is known as the Shia, first Shia theologian. When he heard these words from Ali bin Yaqtin, he said, are you sure about it? And he said, yes. Did he say that he is the chief of my sons regarding Ali, his son? He said, yes. He said, well, you did not realize that he was actually indicating that imamat after him will go to his son Ali. And so we, we see again that even, you know, uh, prominent uh, companions did not know clearly, but there were, you know, indirect ways by which Imam would communicate this message even to people like Hisham bin Hakam. Then we go again to a narration, uh, a very similar one by Ali bin Yaqteen. Um, you know, this was done... Okay, what you have in the screen there is a, is a, is a different one. Uh, let me know, go on to a longer narration that we have from uh, Yazid bin Salid al-Zaydi. And this is very interesting because he says that there was a time when I and my colleagues were, we were going to Hajj. And we met Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq in the way to Mecca. And he says, there I asked this question. I told him that you know, you are pure Imams, but we know that death comes to everyone. Even Rasulullah died. And so, can you tell me, what will happen to us after you? Where should we go? And this is where Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam, na'am, ha'ulai wuldi, that look at these, you know, referring to his own children, uh, these are my children, wa'haza sayyiduhum, referring to Imam Musa al-Kazim, the sixth Imam says, وَهُوَ سَيِّدُهُمْ He is the chief of my sons and he has the ilm and the hukum he has knowledge, wisdom, understanding and the knowledge of whatever is required for the people whenever people have differences in religious matters he has the solution to their problems and then he says that many years after this meeting that I had with the sixth imam where I found out about Imam Musa al-Kazim he says, after a long, long time, I went and met Imam Musa al-Kazim. And I repeated the same kind of questions to him. And when I asked him, can you tell me who is after you? Imam Musa al-Kazim says, Kana abi fi zamanin laysa hadha mithluhu. Imam Musa al-Kazim, knowing that he is a loyal Shia, still hesitated to give the name. He says, you know, the days of my father, when you asked him on the way to Mecca, is different from the days that I am living in. I don't have the luxury of saying it publicly. So Yazid bin Salid, in a way, became, uh, you know, distressed. He, was, he said, what will happen to us then? And when Imam looked at his reaction, that he was really sad and distressed, Imam said, okay, Imam laughed actually, first, and said, okay, now that you asked me, then Imam says to him that, listen, when I left uh, Medina before I was uh, arrested, I had a gathering of Banu Hashim where I had made all my children my uh, wasi. But then there was a private meeting where I made my son Ali as my wasi. And so you see that, you know, the situation were not... Uh, conduce for the Imam to publicly mention Imam Raza salam, but privately he would do that and so Imam now discloses that to uh, Yazid bin Salid with a condition and that's important Imam Musa al-Kazim says O oh Yazid this information innaha wadi'atun indaka this is a trust I am living with you do not disclose it to anyone Except a person who is a wise person or a person whose heart has been tested by Allah for his iman, you know that his iman is solid, or a person who is trustworthy and truthful. Otherwise, don't disclose this secret to others. And then, you know, Imam says that, you know, 
this is what will happen to me and the situation would be so bad for us that he says even my son Ali would not be able to declare his imamat for the first four years of his imamat which is the time of Harun and it is true that imam you know uh, until Harun basically leaves uh, Baghdad goes to Ray and then Khurasan where he dies you know until that time uh, even Imam Raza salam was not in a position to publicly uh, you know declare his imamat and so Imam Musa al-Kazim is now predicting what will happen to Imam Raza salam and he says to Yazid bin Salib that if you need to ask any question don't ask him for four years after four years go to him and then he will respond to your questions and so we we see that you know the uh, the nas and the declaration um, for the imamat of uh, Imam Raza salam has been there sometimes di- directly, sometimes indirectly, depending on the political cir- circumstances that Imam faced at that time. So now let us go on to the problem. We saw the division after Imam Jafar Salih salam. You have the Shia Isma'ashari and then you have those who call themselves Ismaili. After the shahadat of Imam Musa al-Kazim salam, there was another deviation. Eventually the majority continued with Imam Ali Rida alayhi salam. But there was a group which didn't you know, last long. And they were known as the Waqifa. Can you read that? Al-Waqifa. Uh, this is a subsect. It doesn't exist anymore. They didn't survive that long. Uh, and what they believed, they believed that after the, uh, uh, you know, the sixth imam, they started believing. According to our time, when the shahadat happened, they refused to believe in the shahadat of the seventh imam. And they said, because, you know, the sixth imam had once mentioned his son as Al-Mahdi and Al-Qa'im. Remember, in, uh, two, two weeks ago we looked at this uh, title Al-Qa'im has do two meanings. One mean, means somebody who will sit or come in the position of someone else. And the other is Al-Qa'im who will establish the kingdom of God. And so if you look at the first meaning, all the Imams are Al-Qa'im. If you look at the literal meaning of the Mahdi, all the Imams are Mahdi. It means those who have been rightly guided. But if you look at the meaning of Al-Qa'im and Mahdi in a specific sense, that refers only to the Imam who will come at the end of time. And so, uh, they started saying that, well, the Imam Musa al-Kazim is the Qa'im and the Mahdi, and they refused to, uh, you know, accept Imam uh, Ali Raza as the Imam. They are known as Waqifa because the word Waqifa comes from Waqf, Waqafa, which means to stop. Those of you who are expert in reading Quran, there is Waqf, isn't it? One of the signs. What does that mean? Huh? And stop. Waqf means stop. And they are known as Waqifa because they stop at the seventh Imam. They don't believe in the Imam at all. The eighth Imam. And that's why even in Farsi, they were known as, in Farsi books, they are known as Haq Imami. As opposed to Shish Imami, referring to the Ismailis, they are known as Haq Imamis, means they believed in seven Imams only. However, this, this group doesn't exist, and, uh, you know, they are no more there. Uh, but the question comes up, why did they come to exist? There were basically two reasons. One is ignorance. You know, you have Imam Jafar Sadiq saying that my son is Al-Qa'im. Instead of going and asking him, they started to have their own conclusions. And I, I'm not surprised when I look at examples of our own time. You know, our Maharaj, they give one fatwa, they say one thing, and people have their own interpretation of that. And so I'm not at all surprised that people, even those days, you know, Imam describes Imam Musa Qazim as Al-Qa'im in one meaning, but they took it in different meaning. So there were some who did this out of ignorance, only few of them. But the leaders who started this group known as the Waqifa were not ignorant. 
They did this out of greed. Imam Musar Kazim is the first Imam who goes into prison. Other Imams were harassed by the Khulafa. They were under surveillance, you know, maybe house arrest, but never under uh, in, in prison in that way. This is the first Imam. And so because of this situation where people couldn't see Imam directly, his movements and meetings were all, uh, you know, scrutinized by the government all the time. The spies were there, informers were there. And so Imam had appointed many, many wakala. And many of these wakils were wakile mali, not wakile shari. And, you know, especially in the last five years, Imam is in prison. And so they don't even have a point where they can go and give the hukuk that people are bringing to them. And so what happens? Even good people. You know, when shaitan is there, shaitan doesn't go to bad people. He goes to the good people. And these are the people whom a masum imam trusted. And we have to believe that they were trustworthy at that time. But when the wafat of the seventh imam happens, what happens? Shaitan comes in. He says, you know, you have so many dirham and dinars here. Why do you want to hand it over to his successor? That is where this whole issue started. That, well, Imam Musa Kazim is the Mahdi. He is gone in Ghaybat. And we are waiting for his, you know, reappearance. He will establish the kingdom of God. Then we will give him the money. Otherwise, he stays with me. And so this was the main reason. And we will see the examples. Just one more point here that uh, the situation of Imam Musa al-Kazim had become so dangerous that even the Shias, when they sat among themselves and talked about the Imam, they didn't mention his name. There is a very common uh, you know, code word used. They would say, Allah al-Abdu Salih, the good or the virtuous servant of God said this. Al-Abdu Salih refers to the Imam. The, the situation was so dangerous that they could not even utter his, his name publicly. And so keep that in mind. And, and now we come to this uh, situation that, you know, uh, some of these wakala had uh, accumulated wealth in the name of the Imam and they were refusing to hand it over to Imam Rabba alayhi salam and that's where you have this group called uh, Waqifa. Just one example. Uh, of a very prominent Sahabi by the name of Yunus bin Abdul Rahman, a good person. He narrates, he says that after the shahadat of Imam Musa al-Kazim uh, you know, when I realized that uh, Imam Raza is the Imam, I started to, uh, you know, promote Imam Raza as the next Imam. You know, telling people that your Imam is Ali ibn Musa Raza. He says that there were other wakala, and he names uh, Ziyad al-Qandi, who had accumulated 70,000 dinars. Now those days, this amount, maybe for our time it doesn't mean much, but those days 70,000 dinars is a big amount. And the other one had uh, Ali bin Abu Hamza al-Somali. Remember the name Abu Hamza al-Somali? A very good person. A very close companion of, you know, fourth, fifth, and sixth amount. And this is his son. You know, so you have a very virtuous father and a son who was good to one extent, but a, t- a time comes in life when he then deviates. And this is where the meaning of that dua becomes really more uh, live for us, where we say, وَجْعَلْ عَوَاقِبَ أُمُورُنَا خَيْرًا وَاللَّهُ make, make the end of our life good for us. Make sure that we end with Iman and with Taqwa and with righteousness. You know, there is no use that we were good for 90% of our life. In the last one year, we deviate, everything is gone. And this, this is an example that, you know, these people were trusted by a Masum Imam. Uh, but then greed over, over took them. He says that when I realized that Imam Raza is the Imam, I started promoting him. And when they heard that I'm prom- promoting Imam Raza as the next Imam, they invited me uh, with a proposal. Now before when I go there, it's, it's, 
amazing that these two individuals, Ziyad bin Al-Qandi and Ali bin Abu Hamza, they are not ignorant. Remember I said there are two causes for this uh, movement. One was ignorance, but only, only few of them. Majority were out of this greed. You have narrations where you say, for example, uh, where you see uh, Ali bin uh, Ibrahim, he says that I was... Uh, in, uh, yeah, this is a narration from Sheikh Saduq, from Ziyad al-Qandi, the first name that we have in this list. Where he says, I went to Imam Musa al-Qazim, and his son, Ali Rida, was with him. فقال لي, Imam Musa al-Qazim told me, يا زياد, هذا, هذا كتابه كتابي, وكلامه كلامي, ورسوله رسولي. That, oh Ziyad, remember, this son of mine, his book, his letter, or his writing, is like my writing. Whatever he says is as if I have said it. If he sends a messenger to you, it's as if my messenger has come to you. وَمَا قَالَ فَالْقَوْلُ قَوْلِ Whatever he says is actually the same as my statement. So you have Imam Musa al-Kazim mentioning to this person, Ziyad al-Qandi, that Ali is my successor. And so he said out of ignorance, this is greed which is taking them over. Ali bin uh, Abi Hamza of Somali, he also... We have a narration by Hassan bin Ali al Khazaz from Sheikh Saduq narrating this. He says, once we were going to Mecca, and during our traveling, uh, Ali bin Abi Hamza al-Fumali was with us, and he was carrying the, uh, the, the luggage that he, was, he had with him was more than normal. So we asked him, ma hawa, what is this? And he said, hadha lil abd al-salih, this is the property of our Imam Amarani an ahmuluhu ila Ali ibnuhu wa qad awsa ilayhi he has ordered me to convey this property to his son Ali whom he has made his wasi so you have these two individuals who know what is haq they know that Ali ibn Musarada is the Imam but then it is money which you know uh, basically deviated them from the right path and so going back to this uh, narration of uh, Yunus bin Abdurrahman, it says, they called me, these two individuals. And they, they called me and they said, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? If you want money, we'll give you 10,000 dinars. You just stop promoting Ali ibn Musa Rida. And he said, you know, I'm not going to listen to what you're saying, uh, because... I know from the sixth Imam that when people start bid'at in religion, innovations in religion, those who are learned have a duty to speak out. And I see what you are doing is bid'at, this is haram, this is wrong, and therefore I have to speak out and promote the Imam of our time. Eventually, of course, you know, they became enemies of uh, Yunus bin Abdurrahman. Then we have another example of a wakil of the Imam, seventh Imam in Egypt by the name of uh, Usman bin Isa al-Rawasi uh, Imam Raza salam actually sent a letter to him saying that you have some amanat from my father and he sent a letter saying that we don't believe your father is dead he is alive and he is going in Ghaybat and Imam says well I am the son my father has died and the inheritance has been distributed so what are you saying you know and, and so this, this is how we see that you know this group started that it didn't, as I said, didn't last long, but this was a problem, and the problem was more because of uh, hairs and uh, havas, greed, and nothing else. Just a point on this issue that as far as the shahadat of the seventh imam in the prison of Harun is concerned, this is a very well-known fact. Uh, not only that, in order to deflect the blame for himself, Harun actually got more than 50 people the elders of the community to come and view the body of the Imam and to see that we have not tortured him or not done anything to him. He has, that's, he has just died a natural uh, death. And, and so that itself becomes a historical evidence that as far as the seventh Imam is concerned, his shahadat of course is a uh, historical uh, fact. There is no denial of that. 
and all these ideas of waqifa actually is best in this concept that the seventh imam didn't die if you can prove that historically then the waqifa go away and they never really uh, survived anyway and that's why you will see sheikh saduq when he has compiled this book called ayun akhbar rida all the ahadith uh, of imam raza alayhi salam he has a special section where he talks about the death of his father this was that section has been written specially to emphasize the point of rejecting the views of the waqifa uh, group we'll conclude here we have about uh 47 minutes i uh, should just two minutes so we start a little bit late so if you have any questions about tonight or the previous sessions well basically what the people of broadway is on people anyway it's just like uh, if they are bringing this qazi to give testimony that uh, muslim uh, han ibn urwa is okay but you know basically what he is saying is that you know just look at him, look at his not necessarily the whole body are, are there any marks of you know using the sword or not the the issue is that they were more afraid about this uh, blame coming on them that you know imam died in the prison because of them and so and that's why you see his body is then brought in left on this pool uh, of baghdad with the announcement that come and see this is the imam of the shia who died uh, one was the basically to sort of put down the imam but also to let the people know that you know see physically we have not done anything to him he was a prisoner yes in chains but we did not you know kill him in, in, in that way well if they use poison nobody can trace the poison anyway but the, but the guilt is always there any more sisters no okay let us conclude with the dua rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adhaban nar bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin